Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of Refresh, our online Bible study. We are continuing our look at the Ten Commandments and what they mean to us today in the New Testament age. Today we look at the Seventh Commandment, Thou shalt not commit adultery. You know, we live in a very sensual society. Everywhere we look, constantly there is this barrage of um, explicit, sometimes subtle, sometimes not so subtle messages that are placed in front of us. It seems like every commercial now uses sex to sell. It seems like every show has its gratuitous sex scenes in it. And unfortunately, we have become a culture that has devalued the marriage bond. And we see that in several different ways. Uh, we see it in the fact that there's an actual argument now over the definition of marriage. Uh, it's no longer defined like the Bible defines it as a um, monogamous relationship for a lifetime between one man and one woman. Now, there's, uh, there are those who would redefine marriage to include homosexual couples in their union as marriage. There are others who look at marriage as not necessarily uh, a permanent relationship or a monogamous relationship, and really, it's taken its toll. And here's the issue behind that. Um, as we've looked at these commandments, we've always looked at the principle behind the commandment. And when it comes to this commandment of adultery, it's a reminder to us of the numerous times in Scripture that followers of Jesus and the people of God in the Old Testament were looked at as the bride of Christ. Uh, it, there is, there, there is a, a sense in which the relationship between God and his people was intended to be as pure uh, and unadulterated as the relationship of marriage was intended to be. Uh, marriage was intended to be a picture of God's relationship with his people and his people's devotion to him. So it's no wonder if the devil was going to attack that that relationship of marriage would be one of the front lines that he would attack. And boy, are we just... Um, in fact, the battle has gone on for so long now, it's almost imperceivable to a lot of people. Uh, it's possible to you know, listen to music and not catch the, um, the sensual undertones that maybe are there, or to watch a show and not even notice um, you know, the, the references to the normality of sexual relationships outside of marriage. And that goes so counter to the teaching of Scripture. And so we come to this seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. Boy, is there ever a commandment that we need to think about and probe and consider its New Testament application. And we'll take a look at that. And we've got a very clear teaching on that from Jesus himself and what we need to know about that command and how that command applies to our life today. So I'm going to pray and then we're going to dig into our scripture and I invite you to join me. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Holy Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love. You have entered into covenant with us, an exclusive covenant, a covenant in which you have declared your, your eternal everlasting covenant and covenant love toward us to always be faithful to us. And you've called us to be faithful to you. The story of the Old Testament uh, is is filled with episode after episode of your people being unfaithful to you and in the terminology that you used, committing spiritual adultery by going after other gods and forsaking you. And we're not immune to it in the New Testament period. Even though we have been saved by your grace and we've entered into the kingdom of heaven and we are followers of your son, Jesus, we still wax and wane in our faithfulness to you. Father, I want to thank you, first of all, that I'm kept not by my own faithfulness, but by yours. Uh, as you spoke through Paul to Timothy and speak to us today, that even when we are faithless and unfaithful, 
you are still faithful to us. Thank you for your faithful love. Teach us now how our relationships here on earth, how the marriage relationship is one that can give the world around us such a beautiful picture of your commitment to us and our commitment to you. Bless us as we enter your word and read your word. Give us understanding through your Holy Spirit that we might know how to walk closely with you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, I'll join you on the other side with our scripture. So here we are in our text in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 14, where we see the seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery. Now in the Old Testament, adultery was defined as sexual activity beyond one's marriage relationship. It all centered around the act itself. And, you know, it didn't matter what was going on in your heart necessarily, at least in their mind it didn't. It, uh, as long as you didn't act it out, and as long as you were faithful to your spouse, uh, then you did not commit adultery. But there's a clue in the Old Testament that in God's eyes, adultery goes beyond just our behavior and it goes to our heart. Because many times in the Old Testament, God refers to Israel's wandering from him and being disobedient to him as spiritual adultery. In fact, I know this is kind of a blunt way to put it, but it's the way the Bible puts it. Often God accuses his people of whoring after other gods. In other words, desiring not only to have their relationship with him, but to be unfaithful to him and to have this relationship with these false gods. And so immediately there, we, we can draw a connotation that there's, there's more to this concept of adultery. Now, in the Ten Commandments, he stuck to preserving the purity of the marriage bond. But always, he saw adultery as also having a spiritual aspect to it. Now, let's fast forward to the New Testament, because as we have already seen uh, on several occasions in the Sermon on the Mount, especially in this last half of Matthew chapter 5, we have what we call the similitudes. They are marked by this kind of language. You have heard that it was said, but I say to you. In the old way of doing it, in the old covenant, this was what was stated, but I'm taking this to another level. And the, the prefix for that, the context of that, is Jesus said that his followers would have a righteousness that exceeds the scribes and Pharisees. Now, on the surface, if you took that at a surface level, you would think, man, that's impossible, because they kept uh, obedience to the law externally to a T. Uh, they were they were very righteous acting people, but as Jesus pointed out so often, their hearts were rotten to the core. So Jesus is saying, look, life in my kingdom, it's not, by the way, either or. It's not, well, the outer can be whatever it wants to be as long as your heart is good. There were there were several philosophies that developed that said that you know the material was evil and spiritual was good. So whatever happened in the material world really didn't matter as long as the spirit stayed right. We kind of bring that into our culture today and say, well, you know, I know they did wrong, but their heart's in the right place. It's not either or, it's both and. So what Jesus is about to teach does not replace the Old Testament teaching, they, they weren't being given permission now to commit adultery as long as they obeyed what Jesus said. It was, you got to take it a step further. It's not just the external, it's the internal. Let's look at what Jesus said. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. There is our commandment. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already, and that's going to be an important word to us, already 
committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus makes this a heart issue, not a sexuality issue. The sexuality issue is the surface. Adultery, think of it this way, is the fruit, but the heart is the root. So what Jesus is saying, in order to fix the fruit, you've got to address the root. The problem is not that you are committing adultery. That is a problem. But the reason you are committing adultery is that the root is bad. The heart is bad. So he says, you've heard that it was said you should not commit adultery, but I'm saying everybody who looks. Now, this word here for looks means to, um, I'm not quoting it exactly, but it, 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 it refers to an intentional gaze, not necessarily a stare, but it refers to noticing. Noticing is a good way of putting it. I think in the Old Testament of King David, when he committed um, adultery with Bathsheba, there's a lot that you could blame David for. Second Samuel tells us a time when kings go out to war, but David stayed home. There's the first problem. Uh, but David walked out on the roof of his house, and he saw a woman bathing, and he saw that she was beautiful. All right, so in order to take note of the fact she was beautiful, it had to be more than just, oh, there's a woman I need to look away he took note of, he noticed her. And so what, what Jesus is referring here to here is not um, an accidental seeing something, but it's once you've accidentally seen it, not turning away and to have a lustful intent. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, a, a fire begins. You begin to think about it. You, it goes from the eyes to the heart, to the imagination. That is the pathway that lust always takes. It goes from the eyes to the heart, then to the imagination. And Jesus says, you are responsible for your undisciplined heart. That's what Jesus is speaking to here. And so in a little bit of time that we have left, I want to challenge you about your undisciplined heart. And by the way, this is not just a male on female thing. Men are not the only, men lusting after women are not, is not the only issue. There are women who lust after men. Trust me, I see it on Facebook. I see the comments you make about the guys that you consider handsome. And it, it's, so it's a both ways. It's more than just, you know, a glance. This is, this is I'm noticing something, and I'm thinking about, I'm taking the time to describe why this is attractive to me. We laugh at it. We think it's cute. Jesus said it's trouble because it, it belies an undisciplined heart. And if your heart is undisciplined with respect to this, your heart is undisciplined. Here's what I've noticed. Very seldom do I find people who have an undisciplined heart who are walking closely with the Lord. So it's usually symptomatic um, of another spiritual issue. So I want to just, I want to share with you four, um, four steps, four practices, I think that will, um, will help you be proactive. Uh, when Jesus said, take responsibility, he says, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out. Uh, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Now, this is hyperbole. He's not literally saying you should poke your eyes out so you won't look at bad things or cut your hand off so you won't do bad things. But he's going to the extreme to say, look, you've got to take extreme and intentional measures to discipline your heart. So here's what I want you to do. Uh, you know, some of you, if you're still with me, you haven't said, well, pff, I'm not, I, I don't have a problem with lust. I'm not listening. If you're still with me, I want you to know this applies not just to lust, but this is a way to, to, 
to look at whether or not our heart is undisciplined, but, it, but specifically we're going to speak to this issue of protecting ourselves with an undisciplined heart that leads us to lust, where Jesus says we've already, if we've done it in our mind, we've already been unfaithful because faithfulness involves not just our actions, but our heart and our mind. Remember the, the path, our eyes to our heart, to our imagination. So four proactive practices. First of all, protect your eyes. Look what Job said in verse 31. He's arguing his case. Uh, he couldn't have done anything wrong. Why was all this bad happening to him? He said, I've made a covenant with my eyes, how then could I gaze at a virgin? I couldn't have been lustful. I couldn't have been uh, desiring other people in my heart. Why? I made a covenant with my eyes. Again, intentionality. Pre, I like to call this preactive. I've already made some decisions that if I see this, or if I see this, or if I see this, I'm turning away. I'm not going to allow my eyes to go there. So protect your eyes. Do whatever is necessary not to let things come before your eyes. Know, know where the booby traps are. Know where the landmines are. Know the places where you're likely to see something that might cause your gaze to pause a nanosecond. Because if it pauses more than a nanosecond, you're vulnerable. So know where those places are and avoid them. If it's on social media, you know, if it's um, if it's uh, reels that you see that cause you to think that way, or if it's videos on Facebook, or uh, if there are places that you know you can go online to see things you shouldn't see, don't go there. Protect your eyes. Second thing. Feed your mind. Notice what David said. I have stored up your word in my heart. Memorize scripture. In fact, let me add, meditate on and memorize scripture. I've stored up your word in my heart. I've memorized your word. Why? So that I might not sin against you. If you've got a lot of Bible in your mind, it is both a deterrent as well as it is a safeguard. If you're thinking Bible all the time, there's not room in your mind for lustful thoughts. If you're filling your mind with the word of God, also preactively, you are trying to obey what you've read and allow the Holy Spirit to use what you've read to transform you, and it's going to keep you from that uh, i can't remember which one of the old preachers it was who said who said it uh, i want to say it was vance havner it sounds like something vance havner would say that sin will keep you from this book talking about the bible but this book will keep you from sin so as long as you're in the bible you're in the word of god you're filling your mind and this is 100 percent 24 7 52, 365, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, or 365 days out of the year, constantly letting the word of God fill your mind, store it up in your heart. The next proactive step you can take is to control your environment. Paul told Timothy, flee youthful passions. So it wasn't just here's the negative, here's the don't do, and then here's the positive. So let's look at this over here. Let's make us a little chart, the negative and the positive. Flee lust, flee youthful passions. Don't say, well, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to withstand it. Don't try to withstand it. Run from it. When all of a sudden you face temptation, get out of that environment. If you see something online that is causing you to lust, move on, turn it off, shut it down, go to another room, go outside, get a walk, go for a walk. If you are in the company of somebody, excuse yourself, you know, if they're causing you problems. To the best of your ability, get out of it, okay? Get out of it. Watch your environment. And instead, replace that environment with the positives. Pursue 
It means chase it. Okay, so you're you're going from flee, you're running away, and you're running to righteousness, faith, love, and peace, and know that you've got help among all those who call on the Lord with a pure heart. So run away from what is evil and don't just go, okay, I'm free. No, replace, all right? You got to replace your environment. Get out of that negative environment and immediately begin to feed your mind on things that are righteous. Um, one of my favorite passages of scriptures, Philippians 4, 8, finally, brothers, whatever things are true, uh, honorable, noble, just, pure, lovely, uh, commendable, praiseworthy. Think on these things. Dwell on these things. So replace, flee the lusts, run away from, but run toward things that are godly. And then finally, make it a practice to surrender daily to Jesus. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice wholly acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed. Schema. Don't follow the schematic diagram or the pattern. Don't be patterned after this world, but be transformed. metamorphosized that's a, one of those words with a lot of syllables the change of form be transformed by renewing your mind back up to here the philippians 4 8 daily surrender your life to jesus make yourself a living sacrifice start the day saying jesus i'm yours and i want to live like you want to live and then make an intentional effort throughout the day to fill your mind with truth. Store up God's word in your heart. Rehearse Bible verses. Listen to Christian music. Avoid the traps and pursue what is good. This isn't a laughing matter. It's not something that even though it has become so prevalent in, in our culture that it's cute. God said it's a deadly sin because it's an indication of a heart that is not disciplined. And a heart that's not disciplined is a heart that's not surrendered to him and letting him transform you. That's why he redeemed you. There's here's see, here's the big rub. This is what we'll close out with. Here's the big lie of lust. The big lie of lust says that what I look at and what I think is pleasurable and beautiful is better than what God has given me. We would never come out and say it this way, but we're saying, God, you haven't been good to me. That's not the truth. God has been great to you. He who did not spare his own son, how will he not through him graciously give you all things? Whatever is every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. God has given you everything that is good and the devil wants you to think, no, this would be even better. It won't hurt anybody for you just to dream or imagine. Well, see, my dreaming and imagining about something I don't have Living in that fantasy world is taking my focus off what God has provided. It's an undisciplined heart. So whether it is in lust, whether it is just in fantasizing about money, uh, or wish you had this better life, or just wishing your life took, whatever, the, whatever your fantasy is, learn discipline your heart. Guard your eyes. Feed your mind. Control your environment and surrender daily to Jesus. So I hope this has been a blessing. I hope it's been a challenge. I hope there's something in here that God has said, you know what? Why don't you work on that in your life today? If you want any help in any of this, let me know. I got a lot of helps on uh, being able to memorize scripture, reading plans for scripture, things like that. Um, and I know the struggle, all right? Because I'm a, I'm, I'm a human man, just like some of you who'll be watching this are men. Uh, I know it's something we have to be vigilant and intentional about, and we have to desire to want to be pure, even in our heart and mind.
So I hope this will be a challenge to you. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you next time.